and worship. Now, if we're to look at what does the masjid mean Islamically, we look at it from the root of sajada in the Arabic language. Masjid is what we would say is ism makan. It's the place of where you prostrate. But Islamically, masjid can come under three different categories. The first is the place where you prostrate physically, where your forehead goes down on the ground. The second is the place of worship like this. We'd call this a masjid. This is the place where we're going to prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third is this earth. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was talking about his ikhtisas, his specificality amongst the Prophets, he said, Inna Allah ja'ala li al-ard masjidin wa tahura. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted him this earth as a place of prostration, of worship, and purity. Now if we look back at that verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the masjid is for His sake and His sake alone, and we are not to call upon other than Him in the masjid. So we're not allowed to prostrate to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not allowed to use this masjid for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we're not allowed to walk on this earth except for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now our masajid are something that are very important to us. And we know that just through the history of Islam. If we look at the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the first thing that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did when he got to Medina was he built the masjid. He built the masjid. And we know from a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he says, مَنْ بَنَا مَسْجِدٍ بَنَ اللَّهُ لَهُ مِثْلَهُ فِي الْجَنَّةِ Whoever builds a masjid, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will build the likeness of it for him in paradise. And one has to ask themselves, what's the point of having a house for yourself in paradise if you're not going to be there? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be amongst the people of paradise. And be amongst the people who help establish the masajid, especially here in America. Now, we look further. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the Prophet ﷺ talked about that Yawm al Qiyamah, there's going to be seven different types of people who are going to be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a day where there'll be no shade except for his shade. And again, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those people who are under his shade, Yawm al Qiyamah. And he says from amongst them, Rajalun Kalbahu Mu'allik bil Masjid. A man whose heart is connected to the masjid. Somebody walks into the masjid and they feel like, this is my place. I feel at home. You know, I grew up in a house, I didn't feel like I was at home. People constantly yelling, screaming, fighting. I had a house, but I didn't have a home. When I accepted Islam, I remember Eid day, I was over in Sharon, and I felt like, this, this feels like home. This feels like home. I can stay here all day. You guys can leave, I'm going to stay here. This feels like home. Somebody whose heart's connected to the masjid. They feel like this is my place. I love this place. I want to be here all the time. So we see in Islam that we have a huge importance of the masjid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the masajid are for his sake and for his sake alone. And so these masajid that we have here are not for you and your culture. It's not for you and your Pakistani culture. It's not for you and your Arab culture. It's not for you and your African American culture. It's not for me and my Caucasian culture. It's not for my ideology, but it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, specifically and alone. And so alhamdulillah, we have a saying that what got you here won't get you there. What got you here won't get you there. And so alhamdulillah, if we look across America, we find that our communities, our forefathers, our elders, the people who have come before us, the trailblazers of the Muslim community in America have done an excellent job in building masajid. But the question arises now, what's going to be the culture inside those masajid? What's going to be the culture inside those places of worship? And without a doubt, we have a little bit of a clash as to where we're going to go. Which direction are we going to take the culture of the masjid? And everybody's got their idea of how it should be. And so if we look at some of the ahadith, and we look at some of the different issues that we might face in our masjid, because we might see not in this masjid, for example, maybe not this masjid, I might be preaching to the choir. But it might be that we've seen some other masjid that have some issues, or some controversies. 
Number one controversy that we might have is that children shouldn't be in the masjid and they should be quiet. Children should come to the masjid and they should read Quran, they should pray, they should act like angels and they shouldn't run around, they shouldn't make any noise and they shouldn't cause a disturbance. I went to go to a job interview and it was during Ramadan. After the taraway, right after two of the rakahs had completed, the imam stands up and he scolds the kids. He said, be quiet, we're praying here. I'm thinking to myself, I didn't hear nothing. Like, what's, what's his problem? We pray another two rakahs, he stands up again, tells the children, there's a place in the back for you. There's babysitting, you need to go back there. So we have this mentality among some of our people that children shouldn't be in the masjid. The question I pose those people is what do you do with the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on Ibi Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Kunnu nusalli ma'a nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-asha fa'idha sajada wathaba Hussein wathaba Hassan wa Hussein ala dhahrihi fa'idha rafa'a akhadahuma akhthan rafiqan wada'ahuma ala al-ard fa'idha aada aada hatta idha qada as-salaa what do you do with the hadith of the Prophet that Abi Huraira reported where he said that when the Prophet was praying and Hassan and Hussein would get on his back they get on his back you've all been in Masajid you've seen it happen you're praying and then there's some kids running around in the background and Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and the whole front row stands up and looks back who's the problem? what's going on? sometimes even yelling and scolding the children what would these people have done if they'd seen Hassan and Hussein crawling on the back of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? And the important part of the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam akhdan rafiqan that he took them gently. He took them gently, and afterwards, when he finished his prayer, he didn't scold them, he didn't yell at the children, but he put them right on his lap. He put them right on his lap. So we have to ask ourselves, what type of culture are we going to build for the kids in our mission? And it starts at an early age. Now we have a lot of masajid where the children aren't welcome at the masjid. The children aren't welcome. And this is a huge problem. Because if we don't welcome our children, somebody else is going to. So we find in some of our masajid that the children are complaining because they want to go to the church. Because the church has programs. The church has retreats. The church has mission trips. The church allows them to play basketball. Well, we're closing our doors to our kids because we want them to act like perfect angels. And the questions we have to ask ourselves is, what were you like at 21 years old? What were you like at 18? What were you like at 16? What were you like at 15? How did you act? And so we have to create an environment that encourages those children to come so we can deliver them the message of Islam. Likewise, we have a problem with the sisters. We have a problem with the sisters. The sisters shouldn't come to the masjid. This is the mentality of some of the people in our communities. But what do we do with the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he says, لا تمنوا نساءكم المساجد Don't prevent your women from coming to the masjid. That's a command. Don't prevent your women from coming to the masjid. Well, I'll tell you the best way to prevent the women from coming to the masjid is to not build them a place to come to in the first place. I mean, how many masajid do we see in America that there's no prayer space for the women? I know where we got that from. We got it from back home. Because most of the masajid back home, there is no place for the women to pray. And if there is a place for the women to pray, it's dingy, it's dark, there's no lighting, it smells. So we are in effect preventing them from coming to the masjid. Not only that, but we have to find a way to educate our sisters. Not a single person in here online listening to this later will deny the fact that the first line of defense for our children are the mothers then we have to educate them we have to educate the women in our community one of the sahabi the female sahabi she went to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and she said that the men have basically taken all of your speech i mean you know the imam the imam hangs out with the brothers talks with the brothers maybe you get him to play basketball every once in a while He's with the guys all the time. You can ask him whatever you want, whenever you want. But the sisters, they don't always have access to the imam. 
In some communities, they have no access to the imam. And this is a problem. And some people would say that that's not necessary. Well, it seemed necessary to that female Sahabi who asked the Prophet She said, give us a day. Give us a day and you're going to teach us what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught you. So what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? No, go home. Go home. You're not even supposed to be here in the first place. Is that what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said? No, he didn't say that. He promised them, he said, I'm going to give you a day. And so the women congregated and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would go to them and teach them the religion. Some people say the women shouldn't be here in the first place. Again, you look at some of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and we want to say, alright, we're going to be Qur'an and Sunnah, let's look back. Were the women there? The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنِّي لَأَكُمُ لِلسَّلَاةِ وَأَنَا أُرِيدُ وَأَنَا تُولَ فِيهَا That I would come to pray and I would want to lengthen the prayer. فَأَسْمَى بُكَاءَ السَّبِي And then I hear the crying of a child. فَأَتَجَوَّزَ فِيهَا مَخَافَةٍ عَلَىٰ أَنْ أَشَقَّ عَلَىٰ أُمِّهِ So I would shorten my prayer because I would be afraid that I would cause a difficulty to the mother. Sometimes as men, we, we hear a child cry to disturbance. But without a doubt, that's crushing the mother's heart. They don't want to hear their child cry. And they definitely don't want to cause a disturbance for anybody else. And so what do we do? We turn around and say, what are you, you're disturbing us. You're disturbing the prayer. You're disturbing the people because you and your child are here. SubhanAllah, is this what the Prophet ﷺ did? Did he turn around? First of all, the hadith in and of itself tells you that the women were there. They were there. They were a part of the community, a part of the society. Now nobody's saying we should have club parties in here and everybody's intermingling. We have to go back Quran, to make sure that there is protocols. But at the same time, the women were there. They were there and the Prophet ﷺ accommodated them. And he was merciful to them. So we have to take a step back and say, alright, what, what, what type of Islamic culture are we creating in our masjid? Because some people say, well, that's not the way we did it back home. Well, let me ask you a question. How's that working out for those people back home? Huh? How's that working out for the people back home? It's not. It's not working out for anybody over there. The masajid back home, I've been there. I've seen it. They're resting places for pigeons. We have to create a culture. We've got to create a place in here where people want to be here. This is where it's at. I don't want to be at the mall. I don't want to be at the club. I want to be at the mosque. Are you Muslim? No. But that place is cool. I want to be there. I like that place. This has to be the spot. But we have to create that sort of culture inside. So you think about how was the culture of the masjid of the Prophet wasallam? Again, the children were there. The children were there. Not only were the children there, but the women were there. And the Prophet wasallam didn't reject them and tell them to go away. Also, again, having access to the imam. Sometimes people's, well, you know, the women shouldn't come and ask questions. But Hind, she came to complain about Abi Sufyan. And she started talking about some really personal stuff. Saying that basically he's stingy with his money and he doesn't give me what's sufficient for me and for my child. To which the Prophet ﷺ told her it was okay for her to take what met her needs. So again, these sisters, our better half of our community has to have access to the scholarship. Especially where unfortunately we have a lot of ignorance in our communities. And if the husbands aren't capable of delivering that message of Islam to them, if they're not capable of educating them, then we have to create a forum for them where they feel like they can come and get it. What about the ignorant? How do we deal with the ignorant people in Islam? There's a hadith that's a famous hadith. فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم دعوا Arab guy ignorant Bedouin comes into the Prophet's mosque and starts peeing on the ground everybody knows the hadith he's peeing on the, on the floor what would you do 
I'm asking you seriously, what would you do if somebody came in here and started peeing on the carpet? You would whoop him. He would get a good old fashioned, passionate whooping. Right. No contest, no conversation. What did the Prophet ﷺ do? Obviously the Sahaba, they're not going to tolerate this stuff. They stand up, they want to take it to the guy right away. But the Prophet ﷺ says, leave him. Just pour water over it. And the important part is what the Prophet ﷺ said to the people after that. That you have been sent to be easy with the people. You haven't been sent to be difficult with the people and to be harsh. Harsh and Islam don't go together. That's not part of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Just read the seerah and you'll see that. What type of culture are we creating in our masjid? A lot of times if we have somebody come to the masjid that is ignorant or maybe comes in a state that we don't necessarily like, we have ways of dealing with them. There's a masjid in Cape Cod. Young boy comes, he accepts Islam. He's a bit of a wild child. You know, comes from a rich household, runs around, parties, does silly things. After he accepts Islam, he's still drinking. He's still getting drunk. So one night he's at the masjid hooting and hollering and screaming and ah, yelling. What did they do? I can tell you what a lot of masajid would do. They'd call the police. They call the police. In fact, some of our masajid call the police on our own kids. That's the extent that we've gotten to. The masjid is a museum. Except for prayer time. We can come and pray, maybe read some, But the masjid is a museum. What are these people? To call the police on them? They didn't call the police. And alhamdulillah, they didn't. They brought him back home. And they dealt with his ignorance. And they dealt with his shortcomings over a period of time. Now... That young boy is studying in Riyadh, in Jamiat al-Imam University, of Imam University in Riyadh. So we got to ask ourselves, how many people do we turn away that could become great? You don't know who's the next Umar ibn al-Khattab, sitting out there on the street acting like a fool. We have to give them the opportunity to come in here and progress. We have to realize that the masjid is a hospital. The masjid is a hospital for broken hearts and torn souls. And the imam is a soul doctor. And you don't take your child when they have a disease to a mechanic. Not everybody's a sheikh practitioner. But unfortunately, sometimes in our community, everybody thinks they've got to give the dawah right now. Dawah is an art. Dawah is a science. Dawah is a knowledge. There's a process that one has to go through. It's not just for everybody that, okay, I saw a munkar, let me change it right now without having any hikmah, without having any wisdom. It's a science to it. And if you have the wrong person trying to give dawah to these people that come to the masjid, they can cause more harm than they can cause any benefit. And we have to realize that sometimes we get our priorities out of whack. Anybody can come up here and preach Tawheed, 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 Tawheed. Then when you watch their dawah, they throw Tawheed out the window. Some girl comes by the masjid, she doesn't have her hijab on properly. We want to start talking to her about how she's got a dress. Here, put on this niqab. You haven't even gone through the processes. You haven't even looked at what's the most important thing. Somebody wants me to talk about some girl, my daughter's not wearing hijab. Can you talk to her? She doesn't even believe in Allah. She doesn't even believe in Allah. You want me to talk to her about a hijab? She doesn't pray. It doesn't matter if she doesn't pray. The hijab doesn't matter if she's not even praying. The thing that's going to differentiate between us and them is the prayer. If you're not praying, you've jumped off the boat. You're outside of the fold of Islam. And so we have a priority list in Islam when we're talking about da'wah. Da'wah didn't come all down at once upon the people. Aisha said that if it would have come down all at once, the people would have rejected it. These people outside, they're not the Sahaba. We have to be gentle with them. We have something called the curse of knowledge. 
The curse of knowledge is when you become to know something, you forget what it's like to not know. You forget what it's like to not be Muslim. That's what happened. You forgot what it's like to not be practicing. Now, mashallah, tabarakallah, you're sitting in the front row, you're the righteous brother who comes five times a day, and you even make the adhan. Allahu Akbar. You've forgotten what it's like to be the sinner. You've forgotten what it's like to be the one that doesn't wear hijab. You've forgot what it's like to be the one that's watching the things that you're not supposed to watch, touching the things that you're not supposed to touch, looking at the things you're not supposed to look at, drinking the things you're not supposed to drink, eating the things that you're not supposed to eat. Tarbiya, your Islamic development is a process. It's a process. Every single one of you, I don't care whether it's the Imam or the person who just came to Islam last week, every single one of you went through a process to get to where you are right now. You have to afford your brothers and sisters in the masjid the opportunity to go through their process. I'm not racing against you. And you're not racing against him. You're trying to be the best you that you can be. And you know what that is. And Allah knows even better what that is. I'm not comparing myself against you. Yeah, we're going to race to do good deeds against one another. But if I give $10 and you give 100 my $10 might be greater in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if all I've got in my pocket is 10 and all you've got in your pocket is 10,000. We have to afford these people the opportunity to go through the process. We don't see some brother coming to the masjid. We don't know what his state is. Say, brother, where's your beard? Brother, your, your pants are too low. We have to give people the opportunity to develop. It's a process. That's not saying that we deny that things are there and present in the Quran and the Sunnah. But we have to have wisdom in the way in which we deal with people. This is a reality. Again, the masjid has to be a hospital for broken hearts and souls. Allah says in the Quran, Say to my slaves who have transgressed, don't despair in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He forgives all of the sins. He is the most forgiving and the most merciful. We have to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set parameters for us in Islam. In Allah la yaghfiru ay yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna thalika la man yasha. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forgive the person who dies upon a state of idolatry, worshipping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, praying to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They've got their pope. They've got their saint. They've got their sheikh that tells them what to do no matter what it says in the Quran and the Sunnah. Allah is not going to forgive the people for dying upon that state. But He can forgive everything less than that. What's less than that? Everything else. Everything else. We don't encourage you to be an axe murderer. We don't encourage you to be a serial killer. But God forbid you happen to fall into that level of sin. Allah could forgive you. So who are we to shut the doors on the people outside because we don't feel like they're righteous enough to come in to our masajid? You're not righteous enough or you, you don't pray enough or you don't have the appearance enough. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's in these people's hearts. We don't know that that brother that looks like he's an apparent sinner to us, that he isn't praying every single night crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, make me better. He's struggling but he's crying to Allah saying, make me better, help me, guide me. Well, the other brother who thinks, MashaAllah, got my beard, got my thobe, got my miswak, that's three feet long, I'm ready to go. Allah loves me. Allah loves me. I know, I'm good. I got my ticket to paradise. Came in the mail last week. We have to be careful. We have to create a culture where all of those kids outside feel like this is my place. I'm welcome here. Everybody knows my name. There's a story of a Sahabi. His name is Thumama ibn Uthal. Now this Sahabi, before he accepted Islam, was an enemy of Islam. He used to fight against the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. In fact, he used to kill the companions. So this individual got captured in war. And the Prophet ﷺ had him tied to the pillar of the masjid. You know, had him tied to one of the pillars, tied him up, prisoner of war. Now let me ask you a question. If you're a prisoner of war, what is going through your mind? How 
do I get out of here? That's all I'm concerned about. I want to get out. I want to get out of here with my life. Every single day the Prophet ﷺ would go over to Thumama and say, Thumama, what do I do with you? What do I do with you? Thumama would respond, If you kill me, you've killed the one who's got blood on his hands. In other words, I really deserve it to be honest with you. He said, but if you forgive me, then you will find somebody who's ever grateful. The Prophet ﷺ left him. The Prophet ﷺ comes back the next day. The mama, what do I do with you? The mama responded the same way. He said, if you kill me, then you kill the one who's got blood on his hands. And if you leave me, I'll be ever grateful. The Prophet ﷺ comes back a third day. Same question, same answer. On the first day, the Prophet ﷺ comes back to Thumama and Thumama says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Thumama says, I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. He says, Wallahi, there was no face, there was no face on this earth more hated to me than your face. Thumam is talking to the Prophet ﷺ and says, Wallahi, there's no face on this earth that was more hated to me than your face. And there was no religion more hated to me on this earth than your religion. And there was no place on this earth more hated to me than this place right here. So Wallahi, there's no face more beloved to me now than your face. And there's no religion more beloved to me than your religion. And there is no place more beloved to me than this place right here. Brothers and sisters, the question that's begging to be asked is what did he see? What did he see? What did Thumama see? Those three to four days, what did he see? What sort of culture in the masjid did he see? What was he witnessing that took him from being an enemy of his wanted to kill the Prophet وسلم, and his companions to being able to say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah and being able to look the Prophet وسلم, in the face and say there's no face more beloved to me than yours what type of culture was in the masjid what type of things did he see what type of brotherhood do we see Without a doubt, he saw something in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ that affected his heart and made him want to come to Islam. Wallahi, it's a shame on us. And many of us know that it's true that in some of our masajid across America, we'd be ashamed to bring our parents or our co-workers from work. We'd be afraid that they would be embarrassed or something would happen to them or they'd be treated poorly. We look at this example and we ask ourselves, what was the culture of the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ and how do we recreate that? We have to be able to tell those brothers that only come for Jum'ah that this is your house. This place is for you. I don't care what you did last night. I don't care what you did last week. I don't care what you watched, what you saw, what you heard, what you drank, who you touched, who you spent the night with. This place is open to you. Allahu ghafoor rahim Allah is the most forgiving. And so long as you still have a last breath, the doors of forgiveness are open to you. And I'm your brother or I'm your sister in Islam. And I know that just as I struggle, you're going to struggle. And I'm here to hold your hand through the process. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَعَوَّنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى That you are to encourage one another to do good. And we have to encourage those other people to come to Islam. And we have to remind the brothers that sometimes they're in the front row. And they look, mashallah, they got the thobe and they got their beard and they're here all the time. Don't be a fitna to those people. Don't forget what it was like when you weren't practicing, when your faith wasn't strong. Don't forget what it was like to be away from the path 
and so that we can create a culture in our masajid where the brothers and the sisters feel welcome, where the young and the old feel welcome, where the righteous and the people who still have yet to find their way feel welcome. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and bless our communities and help us to create a masjid within it that has the culture of the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that the people that are outside of these walls living in broken homes and broken communities can come in here and find a strong, vibrant community that is not just preaching Islam but practicing it. Aqulu qawli hadha astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah ma ba'du. I'm speechless. May Allah help us to uh, practice what we heard. But in all fairness, inshallah ta'ala, as the other speakers, after salatu maghrib, we'll give everybody a chance to comment, or if there's a question, to answer it. Shaykh's delivery reminds me of our Shaykh, Diyaduddin bin Yahya, he come and speak and ask, are there any questions? I thought not. Drop the mic and leave. <laughs> Everybody's head will be bowed in his lap, knowing that we should practice what we preach. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. After the salat, inshallah ta'ala, we'll open the floor up for questions and answers for the Shaykh Nick, inshallah ta'ala. And then we'll continue with the program. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.